Graham Parsons, Ingram Cecil Connor 3, November 5, 1946, September 19, 1973, known professionally as Graham Parsons, was an American singer, songwriter, guitarist, and pianist. Parsons is best known for his work with the Birds and Flying Burrito Brothers. He also popularized what he called Cosmic American Music, a hybrid of country, rhythm and blues, soul, folk, and rock. He recorded as a solo artist, and with the International Submarine Band, The Birds, and The Flying Burrito Brothers. His relatively short career was described by all music as enormously influential for country and rock, blending the two genres to the point that they became indistinguishable from each other. Parsons was born in Winter Haven, Florida, and developed an interest in country music while attending Harvard University. He founded the International Submarine Band in 1966 and, after several months of delay, their debut album Safe at Home was released in 1968, by which time the group had disbanded. Parsons joined the Birds in early 1968, and played a pivotal role in the making of the seminal Sweetheart of the Rodeo album. After leaving the group in late 1968, Parsons and fellow Bird Chris Hillman formed the Flying Burrito Brothers in 1969, releasing their debut, The Gilded Palace of Sin, the same year. The album was well received but failed commercially. After a sloppy cross-country tour, they hastily recorded Burrito Deluxe. Parsons was fired from the band before its release in early 1970. He soon signed with A&M Records, but after several unproductive sessions he cancelled his intended solo debut in early 1971. Parsons moved to France, where he lived for a short period at Ville and Elcote with his friend Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. Returning to America, Parsons met Emmy Lou Harris through his friend and former bandmate Chris Hillman. She assisted him on vocals for his first solo record, GP, released in 1973. Although it received enthusiastic reviews, the release failed to chart. His next album, Grievous Angel, met with a similar reception, and peaked at number 195 on the Billboard chart. His health deteriorated under several years of drug abuse, and he died in 1973 at the age of 26. Since his death, Parsons has been credited with helping to found both country rock and alt country. He did not consider his work country rock because he felt it should not be categorized in a single genre because it was a unique blend of many genres and styles of music with his own personal twang. In 1968 the birds appeared on the Grand Ole Opry and were met with a hostile crowd. They then appeared on Ralph Emery's WSM radio show, and were shocked to find he had none of their records. Parsons and Roger McGuinn wrote the song Dime Store Truck Drive and Man in response. A few years later Chris Hillman was on the Ralph Emery show and the song was brought up. Emery asked how Graham was doing. Hillman replied he's still dead, Ralph. His posthumous honors include the Americana Music Association President's Award for 2003, and the ranking at number 87 on Rolling Stone's list of the 100 greatest artists of all time. Ingram Cecil Connor III was born on November 5, 1946, in Winter Haven, Florida, to Ingram Cecil Coondog, 1917-1959, and Davis, Nay Snively, Connor, 1923-1965. The Connors normally resided at their main residence in Waycross, Georgia, but Avis traveled to her hometown in Florida to give birth. She was the daughter of citrus fruit magnate John A. Snively, who held extensive properties in Winter Haven and in Waycross. The senior Ingram Connor was a famous World War II flying ace, decorated with the Air Medal, who was present at the 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor. Biographer David Meyer characterized these parents as loving. He wrote in 20,000 Roads that they are remembered as affectionate parents and a loving couple. However, he also notes that unhappiness was eating away at the Connor family, Avis suffered from depression, and both parents were alcoholics. Ingram Connor committed suicide two days before Christmas in 1958, devastating the 12 year old Graham and his younger sister, little Avis. Avis subsequently married Robert Parsons, who adopted Graham and his sister, they took his surname. Graham Parsons briefly attended the prestigious Bowles School in Jacksonville, Florida before transferring to the public Winter Haven High School. After failing his junior year, he returned to Bowles, which had converted from a military to a liberal arts curriculum amid the incipient Vietnam War. For a time, the family found a stability of sorts. They were torn apart in early 1965, when Robert became embroiled in an extramarital affair and Avis' heavy drinking led to her death from cirrhosis on June 5, 1965 the day of Graham's graduation from Bowles. As his family disintegrated around him, Parsons developed strong musical interests, 
particularly after seeing Elvis Presley perform in concert on February 22, 1956, in Waycross. Five years later, while barely in his teens, he played in rock and roll cover bands such as the Pacers and the Legends, headlining in clubs owned by his stepfather in the Winter Haven slash Polk County area. By the age of 16, he graduated to folk music, and in 1963 he teamed with his first professional outfit, the Shilohs, in Greenville, South Carolina. Heavily influenced by the Kingston Trio and the Journeymen, the band played Houdinannies, coffee houses and high school auditoriums, as Parsons was still enrolled in prep school. He only performed with the group in select engagements. Forays into New York City, where Parsons briefly lived with a female folk singer in a loft on Houston Street, included a performance at Florida's Exhibition and 1964 New York World's Fair and regular appearances at the Cafe Raffio on Bleecker Street in Greenwich Village in the summer of 1964. Although John Phillips, an acquaintance of Shiloh George Wrigley, arranged an exploratory meeting with Albert Grossman. The impresario balked at booking the group for a Christmas engagement at the bitter end when he discovered that the Shilohs were high school students. Following a recording session at the radio station of Bob Jones University, the group, encumbered by a creative impasse amid the emergence of folk rock, dissolved in the spring of 1965. Despite his middling grades and test scores, Parsons was admitted to Harvard University's class of 1969 on the basis of a strong admissions essay. Although he claimed to have studied theology, an oblique reference to his close friendship with his residential tutor, Harvard Divinity School graduate student Jet Thomas. In subsequent interviews, Parsons seldom attended his general education courses before departing in early 1966 after one semester. He did not become seriously interested in country music until his time at Harvard, where he heard Merle Haggard for the first time. In 1966, he and other musicians from the Boston folk scene formed a group called the International Submarine Band. After briefly residing in the Kingsbridge section of the Bronx, they relocated to Los Angeles the following year. Following several lineup changes, the band signed to Lee Hazelwood's LHI Records, where they spent late 1967 recording Safe at Home. The album contains one of Parsons' best known songs, Luxury Liner, and an early version of Do You Know How It Feels, which he revised later in his career. Safe at Home would remain unreleased until mid-1968, by which time the International Submarine Band had broken up. By 1968, Parsons had come to the attention of the Bird's bassist, Chris Illman, via business manager Larry Spector as a possible replacement band member following the departures of David Crosby and Michael Clark from the group in late 1967. Parsons had been acquainted with Hillman since the pair had met in a bank during 1967 and in February 1968 he passed an audition for the band, being initially recruited as a jazz pianist but soon switching to rhythm guitar and vocals. Although Parsons was an equal contributor to the band, he was not regarded as a full member of the Birds by the band's record label, Columbia Records. Consequently, when the Birds Columbia recording contract was renewed on February 29, 1968, it was only original members Roger McGuinn and Chris Hillman who signed it. Parsons, like fellow new recruit Kevin Kelly, was hired as a sideman and received a salary from McGuinn and Hillman. In later years, this led Hillman to state Graham was hired. He was not a member of the Birds, ever. He was on salary, that was the only way we could get him to turn up. However, these comments overlook the fact that Parsons, like Kelly, was considered a bona fide member of the band during 1968 and, as such, was given equal billing alongside McGuinn, Hillman, and Kelly on the Sweetheart of the Rodeo album and in contemporary press coverage of the band. Sweetheart of the Rodeo was originally conceived by band leader Roger McGuinn as a sprawling, double album history of American popular music. It was to begin with bluegrass music, then move through country and western, jazz, rhythm and blues, and rock music, before finally ending with the most advanced, for the time, form of electronic music. However, as recording plans were made, Parsons exerted a controlling influence over the group, persuading the other members to leave Los Angeles and record the album in Nashville, Tennessee. Along the way, McGuinn's original album concept was jettisoned in favor of a fully-fledged country project, which included Parsons' songs such as 100 Years From Now and Hickory Wind, along with compositions by Bob Dylan, Woody Guthrie, Merle Haggard, and others. Recording sessions for Sweetheart of the Rodeo commenced at Columbia Records Recording Studios in the Music Row area of Nashville on March 9, 1968. Midway through, 
the sessions moved to Columbia Studios, Hollywood, Los Angeles. They finally came to a close on May 27, 1968. However, Parsons was still under contract to LHI Records and consequently, Hazelwood contested Parsons' appearance on the album and threatened legal action. As a result, McGuinn ended up replacing three of Parsons' lead vocals with his own singing on the finished album, a move that still rankled Parsons as late as 1973, when he told Cameron Crowe in an interview that McGuinn erased it and did the vocals himself and fucked it up. However, Parsons is still featured as lead vocalist on the songs You're Still On My Mind, Life in Prison, and Hickory Wind. While in England with the Birds in the summer of 1968, Parsons left the band due to his concerns over a planned concert tour of South Africa, and after speaking to Mick Jagger and Keith Richards about the tour, he cited opposition to the country's apartheid policies. There has been some doubt expressed by Hillman over the sincerity of Parsons' protest. It appears that Parsons was mostly apolitical, although he did refer to one of the younger African American butlers in the Connor household as being like a brother to him in an interview. During this period, Parsons became acquainted with Mick Jagger and Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. Before Parsons' departure from the Birds, he had accompanied the two Rolling Stones to Stonehenge, along with McGuinn and Hillman, in the English county of Wiltshire. Immediately after leaving the band, Parsons stayed at Richard's house and the pair developed a close friendship over the next few years, with Parsons reintroducing the guitarist to country music. According to Stone's confidant and close friend of Parsons, Phil Kaufman, the two would sit around for hours playing obscure country records and trading off on various songs with their guitars. Returning to Los Angeles, Parsons sought out Hillman, and the two formed the Flying Burrito Brothers with bassist Chris Etheridge and pedal steel player Sneaky Pete Kleinow. Their 1969 album The Gilded Palace of Sin marked the culmination of Parsons' post-1966 musical vision, a modernized variant of the Bakersfield sound that was popularized by Buck Owens amalgamated with strands of soul and psychedelic rock. The band appeared on the album cover wearing nude suits emblazoned with all sorts of hippie accoutrements, including marijuana, tunnel and Sakonal-inspired patches on Parsons' suit. Along with the Parsons Hillman originals Christine's Tune and Sin City were versions of the soul music classics The Dark End of the Street and Do Right Woman, the latter featuring David Crosby on high harmony. The album's original songs were the result of a very productive songwriting partnership between Parsons and Hillman who were sharing a bachelor pad in the San Fernando Valley during this period. The atypically pronounced, for Parsons, gospel soul influence in this album likely evolved from the ecumenical tastes of bassist Chris Etheridge, who co-wrote Hot Burrito No. 1, I'm Your Toy, and Hot Burrito No. 2 with Parsons, and frequent jamming with Delaney and Bonnie and Richards during the album's gestation. Original drummer Eddie Ho, best known for his work with the Monkees and Al Cooper, proved to be unable to perform adequate takes due to an incipient substance abuse problem and was dismissed after two songs, leading the group to record the remainder of the album with a variety of session drummers, including former international submarine band drummer John Corneal, who briefly joined the group as an official member, appearing on a plurality of the tracks and Popeye Phillips of Dr. Hook and the Medicine Show. Before commencing live performances, the group ultimately settled upon original Birds drummer Michael Clark. Technically maladroit in comparison to his predecessors, Clark's striking physical appearance proved to be the primary criterion in this decision. An associate of the band would later recall that the burritos had to be pretty and Corneal didn't fit from that standpoint. While unsuccessful from a commercial standpoint, the album was measured by rock critic Robert Christgau as an ominous, obsessive, tongue in cheek country rock synthesis, absorbing rural and urban, traditional and contemporary, at point of impact. Embarking on a cross-country tour via train, as Parsons suffered from periodic bouts of fear of flying, the group squandered most of their money in a perpetual poker game and received bewildered reactions in most cities. Parsons was frequently indulging in massive quantities of psilocybin and cocaine, so his performances were erratic at best, while much of the band's repertoire consisted of vintage honky-tonk and soul standards with few originals. Perhaps the most successful appearance occurred in Philadelphia where the group opened for the reconstituted birds. Midway through their set, Parsons joined the headline act and fronted his former group on renditions off Hickory Wind and You Don't Miss Your Water. The other burritos surfaced with the exception of Clark, and the joint aggregation played several songs, including Long Black Veil and Going Back. The Flying Burrito Brothers appeared at the Sky River Rock Festival in Tanina, Washington, at the end of August. After returning to Los Angeles, the group recorded the train song, 
written during an increasingly infrequent songwriting session on the train and produced by 1950s R&B legends Larry Williams and Johnny Guitar Watson. Despite a request from the Burritos that the remnants of their publicity budget be diverted to a promotion of the single, it also flopped. During this period, Etheridge realized that he did not share Parsons and Hillman's affinity for country music, precipitating his departure shortly thereafter. He was replaced by lead guitarist Bernie Ledden, while Hillman reverted to bass. By this time, Parsons' own use of drugs had increased so much that new songs were rare and much of his time was diverted to partying with the Stones, who briefly relocated to America in the summer of 1969 to finish their forthcoming Let It Bleed album and prepare for an autumn cross-country tour, their first series of regular live engagements in over two years. As they prepared to play the nation's largest basketball arenas and early stadium concerts, the burritos played to dwindling nightclub audiences. On one occasion, Jagger had to beseech Parsons to fulfill an obligation to his group. As Parsons became a trust fund baby when he came of age, he was still receiving about $30,000 per year, equivalent to $210,000 in 2018, from his family trust during this period, distinguishing him from his many hungry, hard scrabble peers. However, the singer's dedication to the Rolling Stones was rewarded when the Burrito Brothers were booked as one of the acts at the infamous Altamont Music Festival. Playing a short set including six days on the road in Boney Moroni, Parsons left on one of the final helicopters and attempted to seduce Michelle Phillips. Six Days was included in Gimme Shelter, a documentary of the event. With mounting debt incurred, A&M hoped to recoup some of their losses by marketing the burritos as a straight country group. To this end, manager Jim Dixon instigated a loose session where the band recorded several honky-tonk staples from their live act, contemporary pop covers in a countrified vein, To Love Somebody, Blow Die, I Shall Be Released, Honky Tonk Women, and Larry Williams' Boney Moroni. This was soon scrapped in favor of a second album of originals on an extremely reduced budget. Faced with a dearth of new material, most of the album was hastily written in the studio by Ledden, Hillman, and Parsons, with two gilded palace of sin outtakes thrown into the mix. The resulting album, entitled Burrito Deluxe, was released in April 1970. Although it is considered less inspired than its predecessor, it is notable for the Parsons Hillman Ledden song Older Guys and for its take on Jagger and Richard's Wild Horses, the first recording released of this famous song. Parsons was inspired to cover the song after hearing an advanced tape of the Sticky Fingers track sent to Kleinow, who was scheduled to overdub a pedal steel part, although Kleinow's part was not included on the released Rolling Stones version, it is available on bootlegs. Ultimately, and to the chagrin of Hillman, who was not keen on the song amid the band's creative malaise, Jagger and Richards consented to the cover version. Like its predecessor, Burrito Deluxe underperformed commercially but also failed to carry the critical cachet of the debut. Disenchanted with the band, Parsons left the burritos in mutual agreement with Hillman, who was long fatigued by his friend's unprofessionalism. Under Hillman's direction, the group recorded one more studio album before dissolving in the autumn of 1971. In a recent interview with American songwriter Chris Hillman explained that, T. He greatest legacy of the Flying Burrito Brothers and Graham is we were the alternative country band. We couldn't get on country radio and we couldn't get on rock radio. We were the outlaw country band for a brief period. Parsons signed a solo deal with A&M Records and moved in with producer Terry Melcher in early 1970. Melcher, who had worked with the Birds and the Beach Boys and had rejected producing unknown singer-songwriter Charles Manson, was a member of the successful duo Bruce and Terry, also known as the Rip Chords. The two shared a mutual penchant for cocaine and heroin, and as a result, the sessions were largely unproductive, with Parsons eventually losing interest in the project. Terry loved Graham and wanted to produce him, but neither of them could get anything done, recalled writer and mutual friend Eve Babbitts. Long lost, the tapes from this session have gathered a legendary patina, writes David Meyer. The recording stalled, and the master tapes were checked out, but there is conflict as to whether Graham, or Melcher took them. He then accompanied the Rolling Stones on their 1971 UK tour in the hope of being signed to the newly formed Rolling Stones records. By this juncture, Parsons and Richards had mulled the possibility of recording a duo album. Moving into Villain Elcote with a guitarist during the sessions for Exile on Main Street that commenced thereafter, Parsons remained in a consistently incapacitated state and frequently quarreled with his much younger girlfriend, aspiring actress Gretchen Burrell. Eventually, Parsons was asked to leave by Anita Pollenberg, Richard's longtime domestic partner. Decades later, 
Richards suggested in his memoir that Jagger may have been the impetus for Parsons' departure because Richards was spending so much time playing music with Parsons. Rumors have persisted that he appears somewhere on the legendary album, and while Richards concedes that it is very likely Hayes among the chorus of singers on Sweet Virginia, this has never been substantiated. Parsons attempted to rekindle his relationship with the band on their 1972 American tour to no avail. After leaving the Stones camp, Parsons married Burl in 1971 at his stepfather's New Orleans estate. Allegedly, the relationship was far from stable, with Burl cutting a needy and jealous figure while Parsons quashed her burgeoning film career. Many of the singer's closest associates and friends claimed that Parsons was preparing to commence divorce proceedings at the time of his death, the couple had already separated by this point. Parsons and Burl enjoyed the most idyllic time of their relationship in the second half of 1971, visiting old cohorts like Ian Dunlop and family slash blind faith slash traffic member Rick Greck in England. With the assistance of Greck and one of the bassist's friends, a doctor who also dabbled in country music and is now known as Hank Wangford, Parsons eventually stopped taking heroin, a previous treatment suggested by William Burroughs proved unsuccessful. He returned to the U.S. for a one-off concert with the Burritos, and at Hillman's request went to hear Emmy Lou Harris sing in a small club in Washington, D.C. They befriended each other and, within a year, he asked her to join him in Los Angeles for another attempt to record his first solo album. It came as a surprise to many when Parsons was enthusiastically signed to reprise records by Mo Austin in mid-1972. The ensuing GP, 1973, featured several members of Elvis Presley's TCB band led by lead guitarist James Burton. It included six new songs from a creatively revitalized Parsons alongside several country covers, including Humble Glazer's Streets of Baltimore and George Jones's That's All It Took. Parsons, by now featuring Harris as his duet partner, toured across the United States as Graham Parsons and the Fallen Angels in February to March 1973. Unable to afford the services of the TCB band for a month, the group featured the talents of Colorado-based rock guitarist Jock Bartley, soon to skyrocket toe fame with Firefall, veteran Nashville session musician Neil Flaunt on pedal steel, eclectic bassist Kyle Tallis, best known for his work with Dolly Parton and Larry Coryell, and former Mountain drummer Andy Smart. The touring party also included Gretchen Parsons, by this point extremely envious of Harris, and Harris' young daughter. Coordinating the spectacle as road manager was Phil Kaufman, who had served time with Charles Manson on Terminal Island in the mid-60s and first met Parsons while working for the Stones in 1968. Kaufman ensured that the performer stayed away from substance abuse, limiting his alcohol intake during shows and throwing out any drugs smuggled into hotel rooms. At first, the band was under-rehearsed and played poorly, however, they improved markedly with steady gigging and received rapturous responses at several leading countercultural venues, including Armadillo World Headquarters in Austin, Texas, Max's Kansas City in New York City, and Liberty Hall in Houston, Texas, where Neil Young and Linda Ronstadt sat in for a filmed performance. According to a number of sources, it was Harris who forced the band to practice and work up an actual set list. Nevertheless, the tour failed to galvanize sales off GP which never charted in the Billboard 200. For his next and final album, 1974's posthumously released Grievous Angel, he again used Harris and members of the TCB band for the session stop the record received even more enthusiastic reviews than had GP, and has since attained classic status. Its most celebrated song is a Parsons-Harris duet cover of Love Hurts, a song that remains in Harris' solo repertoire. Notable Parsons pen songs included $1,000 Wedding, a holdover from the Burrito Brothers era, and Brass Buttons, a 1965 opus that addressed his mother's alcoholism. A new version of Hickory Wind was included, while Lou Las Vegas, co-written with Greg, dated from the GP sessions. Although Parsons only contributed two new songs to the album, In My Her of Darkness and Return of the Grievous Angel, he was highly enthused with his new sound and seemed to have finally adopted a diligent mindset to his musical career, limiting his intake of alcohol and opiates during most of the sessions. Before recording, Parsons and Harris played a preliminary four-show mini-tour as the headline act in a June 1973 Warner Brothers country rock package with the New Kentucky Colonels and Country Gazette. A shared backing band included former Birds lead guitarist and Kentucky Colonel Clarence White, Pete Kleinow, and Chris Etheridge. On July 14, 1973, White was killed by a drunk driver in Palmdale, 
California while loading equipment in his car for a concert with the new Kentucky Colonels. At White's funeral, Parsons and Bernie Ledden launched into an impromptu touching rendition of Farther Along. That evening, Parsons reportedly informed Phil Kaufman of his final wish, to be cremated in Joshua Tree. Despite the almost insurmountable setback, Parsons, Harris, and the other musicians decided to continue with plans for a fall tour. In the summer of 1973, Parsons' Topanga Canyon home burned to the ground, the result of a stray cigarette. Nearly all of his possessions were destroyed with the exception of a guitar and a prized Jaguar automobile. The fire proved to be the last straw in the relationship between Burl and Parsons, who moved into a spare room in Kaufman's house. While not recording, he frequently hung out and jammed with members of New Jersey-based country rockers Quacky Duck and his barnyard friends and the proto-punk Jonathan Richman and the Modern Lovers, who were represented by former Birds manager Eddie Tickner. Before formally breaking up with Burl, Parsons already had a woman waiting in the wings. While recording, he saw a photo of a beautiful woman at a friend show and was instantly smitten. The woman turned out to be Margaret Fisher, a high school sweetheart of the singer from his way cross, Georgia, days. Like Parsons, Fisher had drifted west and became established in the Bay Area rock scene. A meeting was arranged and the two instantly rekindled their relationship, with Fisher dividing her weeks between Los Angeles and San Francisco at Parsons' expense. In the late 1960s, Parsons became enamored of and began to vacation at Joshua Tree National Monument in southeastern California, where he frequently partook in psychedelics and reportedly experienced several UFO sightings. After splitting from Burl, Parsons often spent his weekends in the area with Margaret Fisher and Phil Kaufman, with whom he had been living. Scheduled to resume touring in October 1973, Parsons decided to go on another recuperative excursion September 17. Accompanying him were Fisher, personal assistant Michael Martin, and Dale McElroy, Martin's girlfriend. Kaufman later declared that Parsons' attorney was preparing divorce papers for him to serve to Burl while the singer remained in Joshua Tree on September 20. During the trip, Parsons often retreated to the desert, while the group visited bars in the nearby hamlet of Yucca Valley, California on both nights of their stay. Parsons consumed alcohol and barbiturates in high amounts. On September 18, Martin drove back to Los Angeles to resupply the group with marijuana. That night, after challenging Fisher and McElroy to drink with him, Fisher didn't like alcohol and McElroy was recovering from a bout of hepatitis C, he said, I'll drink for the three of us and proceeded to drink six double tequilas. They then returned to the Joshua Tree Inn, where Parsons purchased morphine from an unknown young woman. After being injected by her in room number eight, he overdosed. Fisher gave Parsons an ice cube suppository, and later on a cold shower. Instead of moving Parsons around the room, she put him to bed and went out to buy coffee in the hope of reviving him, leaving McElroy to stand watch. As his respiration became irregular and later ceased, McElroy attempted resuscitation. Her efforts failed and Fisher, watching from outside, was visibly alarmed. After further failed attempts, they decided to call an ambulance. Parsons was declared dead on his arrival at High Desert Memorial Hospital at 12.15 a.m. on September 19, 1973 in Yucca Valley. The official cause of death was an overdose of morphine and alcohol. According to Fisher in the 2005 biography Grievous Angel, an intimate biography of Graham Parsons, the amount of morphine consumed by Parsons would be lethal to three regular users, thus, he had likely overestimated his tolerance in light of his diminished intake despite his extensive experience with opiates. Keith Richards stated in the 2004 documentary film Fallen Angel that Parsons understood the danger of combining opiates and alcohol and should have known better. Upon Parsons' death, Fisher and McElroy were returned to Los Angeles by Kaufman, who dispersed the remnants of Parsons' drugs in the desert. Before his death, Parsons stated that he wanted his body cremated at Joshua Tree and his ashes spread over Cap Rock, a prominent natural feature there. However, Parsons' stepfather Bob organized a private ceremony back in New Orleans and neglected to invite any of his friends from the music industry. Two accounts state that Bob Parsons stood to inherit Graham's share of his grandfather's estate if he could prove that Graham was a resident of Louisiana, explaining his eagerness to have him buried there. To fulfill Parsons' funeral wishes, Kaufman and a friend stole his body from Los Angeles International Airport and in a borrowed hearse, they drove it to Joshua Tree. Upon reaching the Cap Rock section of the park, they attempted to cremate Parsons' corpse by pouring five gallons of gasoline into the open coffin and throwing a lit match inside. What resulted was an enormous fireball. 
The police gave chase but, as one account puts it, were encumbered by sobriety, and the men escaped. The two were arrested several days later. Since there was no law against stealing a dead body, they were only fined $750 for stealing the coffin and were not prosecuted for leaving of his charred remains in the desert. Parsons's body, what remained of it, was eventually buried in Garden of Memories Cemetery in Metairie, Louisiana. The site of Parsons' cremation was marked by a small concrete slab and was presided over by a large rock flake known to rock climbers as the Graham Parsons Memorial Hand Traverse. The slab has since been removed by the U.S. National Park Service, and relocated to the Joshua Tree in dot there is no monument at Cap Rock noting Parsons' cremation at the site. Joshua Tree Park guides are given the option to tell the story of Parsons' cremation during tours, but there is no mention of the act in official maps or brochures. Fans regularly assemble simple rock structures and writings on the rock, which the Park Service sandblasts to remove from time to time. Stephen Thomas' early wine of all music describes Parsons as enormously influential for both country and rock, blending the two genres to the point that they became indistinguishable from each other, his influence could still be heard well into the next millennium. In his essay on Parsons for Rolling Stone magazine's 100 Greatest Artists list, Keith Richards notes that Parsons' recorded music output was pretty minimal. But nevertheless, Richards claims that Parsons' effect on country music is enormous. T. This is why we're talking about him now. The 2003 film Grand Theft Parsons stars Johnny Knoxville as Phil Kaufman and chronicles a farcical version of the theft of Parsons' corpse. In 2006, the Gandalf Hennig directed documentary film titled Graham Parsons, Fallen Angel was released. Emmy Lou Harris has continued to champion Parsons' work throughout her career, covering a number of his songs over the years, including Hickory Wind, Wheels, Sin City, Luxury Liner and Hot Burrito No. 2. Harris's songs Boulder to Birmingham, from her 1975 album Pieces of the Sky, and The Road, from her 2011 album Hard Bargain, are tributes to Parsons. In addition, her 1985 album The Ballad of Sally Rose is an original concept album that includes many allusions to Parsons in its narrative. The song My Man, written by Bernie Ledin and performed by the Eagles on their album One Border, is a tribute to Graham Parsons. Both Ledin and Parsons were members of the Flying Burrito Brothers during the late 1960s and early 1970s. The 1973 album Crazy Eyes by Poco pays homage to Parsons, as Richie Fiore composed the title track in honor of him, and sings one of Parsons' own compositions, Brass Buttons. The album was released four days before Parsons died. A music festival called Graham Fest or the Cosmic American Music Festival was held annually in honor of Parsons in Joshua Tree, California, between 1996 and 2006. The show featured tunes written by Graham Parsons and Gene Clark as well as influential songs and musical styles from other artists that were part of that era. Performers were also encouraged to showcase their own material. The underlying theme of the event is to inspire the performers to take these musical styles to the next level of the creative process. Past concerts have featured such notable artists as Sneaky Pete Kleinow, Chris Etheridge, Spooner Oldham, John Molo, Jack Royerton, Gib Gilbo, Counting Crows, Bob Warford, Rosie Flores, David Laurie, Barry, and Holly Teshin, George Tomsko, Jan Brown, Lucinda Williams, Polly Parsons, The Road Mangler Phil Kaufman, Ben Fong Torres, Victoria Williams, Mark Olson, and Sid Griffin as well as a variety of many other bands that had played over the two- or three-day event. In addition, the Graham Parsons Tribute, in Waycross, Georgia, is a music festival remembering Parsons in the town in which he grew up. Additional tributes spring up every year, the latest being the Southern California Graham on Celebration by the Rick and Bastards in July, 2013, celebrating the life and legacy of a simple country boy with a dream, Graham Parsons. In February 2008, Graham's protege, Emmy Lou Harris, was inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. Despite his influence, however, Parsons has yet to be inducted. Radley Balco has written that Parsons may be the most influential artist yet to be inducted to either the Rock and Roll or Country Music Halls of Fame. And it's a damn shame. The Graham Parsons Petition Project, now Graham Parsons International, was begun in May 2008 in support of an ongoing drive to induct Parsons into the Country Music Hall of Fame. On September 19, 2008, 
the 35th anniversary of Parsons' death, it was first presented to the Country Music Association, CMA, and Hall as a list of supporters together with the official nomination proposal. The online list of supporters reached 10,000 on the 40th anniversary of his death with more than 13,000 currently listed. Annual Graham Parsons International Concerts in Nashville and various other cities, now in the 11th year, support the petition causes to other such tribute events. In November 2009, the musical theater production Grievous Angel, The Legend of Graham Parsons premiered, starring Anders Drarup as Graham Parsons and Kelly Prescott as Emmy Lou Harris. Directed by Michael Bade and co-written by Bade and David McDonald, the production was inspired by a March 1973 interview Hat Bate conducted with Parsons, which became Parsons' last recorded conversation. In 2012, Swedish folk duo First Aid Kit released the single Emmy Lou from the album The Lion's Roar. The song's chorus is a lyrical acknowledgement of the Graham Parsons and Emmy Lou Harris singing partnership, and to the romantic relationship between them that never fully developed before his death. In the fall of 2012 Florida festival promoter and musician Randy Judy presented his bio-musical Farther Along, The Music and Life of Graham Parsons at Magnolia Fest at the Spirit of the Suwannee Music Park. A Cleveland, Ohio area band, New Soft Shoe, performs as a tribute band to Parsons' music. A St. Paul, Minnesota band, The Gilded Palace Sinners, is another Parsons tribute group. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.